Don't you oh, clip the mic. All right. Greetings, fellow nerds. <laughs> okay, so it's bloody hot, but is it hot enough? Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. So most things burn if you get them hot enough. That's the oxygen from the air reacting with the substance that will generate heat, which will then drive the substance to react more with the oxygen from the air. That drives the reaction forward and forward and forward. So what we see is flames and burning, right? If a substance is more reactive, what we generally see is that it has a lower temperature at which it will react with oxygen. So you can have substances that are so reactive that their auto ignition temperature is actually below room temperature. We've seen this behavior before in our good friend white phosphorus, where the oxygen from the air will react with the solid and it will eventually burst into flames. But if our reactive material is a gas, what we have is pretty much instant mixing, so we have pretty much instant ignition. Making these sort of highly reactive substances generally is pretty difficult, but there is one example where it's fairly easy to generate, and that's silane. Everyone always makes silane in exactly the same way, like the same demo setup, and who am I to break on tradition? Actually, there's kind of two ways of doing it, because our end product we need is magnesium silicide. We're gonna react that magnesium silicide with some acid and that'll generate silane. So we need to make magnesium silicide. So the first way is to take silicon dioxide and magnesium and mix them together and ignite them. What happens first is the magnesium pulls the oxygen off the silicon to make silicon metal and magnesium oxide. And then you have excess magnesium in there to react with the formed silicon and that forms the magnesium silicide. So it works, but I, I feel it's a little messy, right? Generate all this magnesium oxide. The magnesium doesn't really mix well with the silicon that's newly formed. It all happens very quickly. So you don't get big, good chunks of magnesium silicon side generally right you can also be very violent nearly flash powder like so here we have the pyromaniac Nile red just lighting fires in his fume hood like a maniac come on Nile red there's more to chemistry than just lighting fires come on just settle down so our other option is to use elemental silicon from the get-go and react that with the magnesium metal and just torch it until it reacts I only have a very small amount of elemental silicon and it was forged in the heart of a dying thermite and it's probably one of the most beautiful products I've ever made it's got these lovely crystals in it, and, and more than that, more than just physical beauty, every time I look at it, I remember all the great times I had with my friends when we were making that product, we had a great day together, and it was just simpler times, and I just look at this product and I, I just kind of remember all the fun we had making it. I, I suppose it's really just one of these chemicals that's very special to me. So we grind it up, we want it to be really fine to react with the magnesium, but we also want to add something else in there so that the whole reaction kind of proceeds a bit faster so I thought I'd put a little bit of elemental silicon in there also a little bit of silicon dioxide so the silicon dioxide will drive the reaction forward and generate a lot of heat with magnesium we load our product into our least favorite test tube just the test tube that we hate most of all and then we want to cover the top of it with some sand to stop the magnesium from reacting with the air preferentially we want it reacting with the silicon dioxide and the silicon metal in the test tube here's where things go wrong ever so slightly because for some reason there's some water or some moisture trapped at the bottom of the test tube and when I'm heating it it's actually driving the powders to mix so the magnesium powder and our precious elemental silicon and the stoichiometric silicon dioxide all just mix with the masses of silicon dioxide on the top of the test tube and it all gets mixed together before it ignites. This complete change to the ratios completely stuffs it up although it still does burn Ideally what we're seeing is big chunks of magnesium silicide of this black material but because all that extra sand got in there and ruined all the ratios we just end up with all this fine crappy powder so we really didn't end up perfecting the recipe at all in fact it's worse than what would have happened if I just used normal sand and magnesium. Anyway, let's press on and not think about the consequences of our actions. We've done this right, we could generate silane gas by adding some of this powder to weak hydrochloric acid. So all those flames are tiny pockets of gas going out and reacting with the air pretty much instantaneously. And it does that so fast because it's already at its auto ignition temperature, so we just see flames. All right, how do we make this demo more dramatic? Let's grab some soap, all right? Because what we want to do is generate some bubbles, right? Straight away, we know it's not going to work terribly well because we're adding like soap to an acid solution. So it's not really going to foam terribly well, but it still does work to an extent. So what we can do now is add our magnesium silicide. It'll react with the hydrochloric acid and bubbles of silane will hopefully get caught in the foam. 
mm, wasn't really doing anything. And for some reason, no one's taken away my oxygen cylinder that I have. So let's pump some oxygen in. <laughs> okay, this still kind of sucks. I was hoping for an explosion. I'll just keep trying until I get an explosion, I suppose. I uh, probably shouldn't have done this as much as I had. I just forgot that it was acid and I was just spraying acid droplets everywhere. All over the metal of the stand and the camera and everywhere. Never good ideas, do I? Never good ideas. Alright, so that's silane, but that's not enough for me, you know. I, I want at least another pyrophoric gas. There are other ones out there, but I just couldn't work out how to make any of them myself, so... A lot of people have said I'm very Australian, but we're about to do the most Australian thing I've ever done. That's right, we're outsourcing difficult work to overseas. Hey, this is not my channel. What am I doing here? That's another chemistry YouTuber, Chemical Force. He sent me a message, he's like, I love to collaborate, I have every chemical known to man in vast quantities, we should do a video together. And of course I was like, what, what are you up to? No, but seriously, what are you up to? Anyway, the chemical he's making is diborane, which has a really weird chemical structure and looks like it's made up or it's going to appear in the background of some terrible sci-fi show where they just write chemical structure on the whiteboard and have no idea what they're doing. But turns out it's actually correct. Well, you know, electrons aren't real, chemistry isn't real, everything's made up, so... The most normal way of making diborane is reacting tin 2 chloride with potassium borohydride. Potassium borohydride is a cool chemical which I don't have uh, maybe I should get, it's cool. So we mix the two reactions together. And then we heat them very slowly and they will generate the diborane. Which, when it mixes with enough air, will burst into flames. Being a boron chemical, the flames that it produces are bright green. So it has that really nice green tinge to it as the diborane burns, forms boron trioxide and water. Green's a Christmas colour. Is this a Christmas episode? You can cover the test tube which stops the flames, but then it allows the diborane to build up within the test tube. So when you finally release the diborane, it mixes with the air and of course bursts into flames again. Diborane's another one of those weird rocket fuels that was considered very briefly in the 1960s because it worked really well as a rocket fuel, apart from the fact that it blowed up all the time, was highly toxic and super dangerous to work with. Fuck me. Chemistry really did fucking peak in the 60s, didn't it? So Chemical Force said he had one other way of generating diborane by reacting his huge rocks of buddy lithium hydride. That's a cool chemical. With boron tribromide. Look, this is... this is madness. What do you want? So for this reaction, what he's going to do is he's going to melt the lithium hydride, as you do, in, in the test tube, and then add the boron tribromide in through the top of the test tube. This generates a lot of diborane very quickly. Of course, the diborane is very hot. It's been generated very hot, so it's way, way above its auto-ignition temperature. So it burns with this beautiful, beautiful green flame. and I feel insecure about my filming methods. I really should have a black background or like that cool orange background. I should do something like that. If you like these clips, you'll like Chemical Horse's channel, so go check it out. The link's in the description. He does a lot of videos with obscure chemicals and reagents, stuff that I can't do because I don't own those chemicals. Maybe there is a link to it in the description. Collaboration. Thanks to my Patreons, I know this wasn't one of the three projects that I'm meant to be working on. I, I swear I am working on them. If you want to join Patreon, you can know what those projects are that I'm meant to be doing, or you can suggest better ones, or just tell me that I should just be making videos fast, so that's fine. Of course, you can join the Discord. There's over 2,000 members there now. 2,000 people. That's a lot of people. And um, I'll see you next time. You believe in it, it's real. Fucking, I don't know.